Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and start. Um, good afternoon, everybody. You're joining the latest edition of the Hood Museum of Arts virtual public programming series, and I'm Sharon Reed, Programs and Events Coordinator. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual conversation today, Art and Knowledge, Creating Spaces for Learning. And before we begin, I have just a couple of reminders. For those of you joining us for the first time today, we do suggest making the following modification to your screen in order to have the best viewing experience. When speakers share their screen, you should see a green bar at the top of your screen that says they're sharing. And to the right of that is a tab that reads viewing options. Click on viewing options and select side by side from the drop down menu. This will allow you to view both the images and the speaker without overlap. I do understand I've heard some people this isn't necessarily a feature that's available on an iPad. Um, so I apologize, but for those of you who do have access to that feature, um, I would recommend it. Today's presentation will last approximately one hour. We'll begin with acknowledgements and brief introductions, personal experiences from both Jamie and Jamie, followed by a case study, then questions from all of you. Please feel free to type a question into the Q&A feature at absolutely any time during the program and we'll do our best to answer them as we have time. The program is being recorded and um, we will share the link on the Hood social media platforms. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers, Jamie Powell, Associate Curator of Native American Art and Jamie Rosenfeld, Museum Educator. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, I'd like to begin um, with a land acknowledgement. The Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth is situated upon the ancestral and unceded lands of the Abenaki peoples. This acknowledgement reminds us of the significance of place, the continued existence of indigenous peoples, and the museum and Dartmouth's commitment to building respectful relationships with those who call these lands home today. And we also wanted to thank you all for joining us um, during what we know is a really challenging time for a lot of people. So let me first say our thoughts go out to all who have suffered with coronavirus or experienced the loss of family, friends, or colleagues. We wish you healing and good health. So as Sharon mentioned, Jamie and I are going to start our presentation today with our own personal experiences. And then we will lead into a conversation about the different ways we have collaborated between education and curatorial um, for works in our collection and exhibitions featuring indigenous artists. Um, as Sharon mentioned, there is a Q&A. We will get to that at the end, but feel free to enter any questions you have throughout the whole program. You'll also notice at the bottom of your screen that there is a chat function we're hoping to use that to create a little interactivity. So throughout the presentation, Jamie and I will be posing prompts and questions for you to consider. And we invite you, if you feel comfortable, to enter your thoughts and your responses into the chat feature. Um, we may or may not have time to read any of the responses at the end, but if you are okay with us sharing what you write, if you could just write your name at the end of your response, then we'll know you feel comfortable sharing. Um, so um, without further ado, um, I'll explain a little bit about myself and my role at the museum and my introduction to museums. So we're starting with this photo, which is um, in our Indigenous Australian exhibition when we first reopened the museum in January 2019. And the two adorable kids that you see sitting on the floor doing an art project are Jamie Powell's children. Um, and we really wanted to start here from a place of early formative experiences in museums. So I personally um, had very positive experiences with museums growing up. My parents made it a priority to take me and my sister into um, New York City on the weekends to attend family programs at the Whitney Museum of American Art. I was very lucky because I lived in New York and had access to a lot of amazing museums. Um, but it really was a testament to my parents to making this a priority and also to the amazing museum educators at the Whitney. Um, they really made the art come to life for kids. I was so excited every time I went to discover new art, new artists, 
engage in hands-on art making projects. And this really affected my career path before most people knew what a museum educator was. Most of my peers, I was telling people I wanted to become a museum educator. Um, and for me, my positive experience led to wanting all young people to have that access and, and those positive experiences to museums. And this really affects my goals for teaching and my priorities and my values. For me, it's less important whether a student walks out of the museum knowing the artist's name or knowing the date or the title of a painting. It's more important to me that they felt welcomed in the museum, that they felt comfortable, that they felt like their voices were heard, and that they could see themselves coming back. So this idea of making young people feel like museums are a place for them has really driven my work in the last decade in the field. Um, and you'll notice that we have a, um, question, a couple of questions at the bottom of the slide. This is where we wanna invite you to reflect on your own experiences. What were your first experiences in museums? What museum? How old were you? And was it positive or was it negative? And what impact did it have? So this is where you can enter your thoughts into the chat and sign your name at the end if you're comfortable with us sharing them. Um, so hello, I am Jamie Powell. I am a citizen of the Osage Nation. Uh, my community is based in what is now Northeastern Oklahoma. And I am the Associate Curator of Native American Art at the Hood Museum, as well as a lecturer in the Native American Studies Department. Um, so like Jamie, I had many early experiences in museums uh, and many of them were positive. Um, however, not all of them. Growing up, uh, my father was in the Navy, actually lived in about 13 different places by the time I was 14 years old. Um, but during my elementary school years, we lived north of Chicago and uh, had the great opportunity as a family um, and through my classes to go and see some of the great cultural institutions um, that that city has to offer. Um, experiencing the Museum of Science and Industry as a kid um, was an incredible um, and enchanting experience that made everyone, I think, want to be an astronaut for a while um, or an engineer. Uh, and, uh, you know, climbing through the uh, pyramid at the Field Museum made everyone want to be um, an archaeologist. Uh, in fourth grade, which was the year in the Illinois State Curriculum that uh, Native Americans were taught as a unit was um, when we took a field trip, a uh, field trip to the Field Museum to see the Native North American Cultures Hall. And I was really excited um, to show my peers, my classmates, um, that I knew everything about Native Americans and that they had an exhibit on Osages. And I was really excited for them to see that part of my life. Uh, however, when we arrived uh, and saw the Osage case, what I saw on view wasn't uh, commensurate with my own experience as an Osage person. The clothes that were on the mannequins, uh, who by the way were all male mannequins, um, were not the kind of clothing that anyone in my community wore during our dances or other gatherings um, at the time. And, you know, it really made me feel disconnected from my own culture. Um, and it also made my friends um, feel like they had an opening to make fun of me. Um, I was teased because I couldn't possibly be a real Native American because I didn't live in a teepee or I didn't um, paint with all of the colors of the wind or have a friend raccoon who I talked to um, in the forest. But um, I'm making a Pocahontas Disney movie reference there for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, but, you know, uh, for me, that was really um, a difficult experience, but also an experience that pushed me, um, you know, throughout my career and, you know, my school um, and gave me a lot of drive. So uh, my vision is to make museums and academic institutions places that belong to all of us, that speak to all of us, and that reflect our multiple and complex experiences in creative, meaningful, and relevant ways. 
I've long been intrigued by the ability of art and material culture to engage audiences, um, to transform or shift perspectives in ways that differ from, um, you know, kind of the educational system or traditional academic work. Um, more specifically, I am interested in looking at how art and objects can be used in conjunction with the work that our incredible educators are doing um, and our professors at the college are doing as a means to engage and communicate um, in complex conversations and with broader and more diverse audiences. So um, when I began my role here at the Hood Museum, the installation for the reopening um, had already been curated by um, one of my sheroes, Raina Green, who's an amazing human. Um, and I was thrilled that Raina and my new colleagues had put contemporary Native art in a central place within the upstairs gallery. So when you ascend the cache stairwell in the museum, before you even walk into the historic American art gallery, you are confronted with this contemporary Native art. And while it may seem like a small shift, this can really have a big impact on the kinds of conversations um, that our audiences have about um, Native peoples. Um, I was also excited uh, to begin working with Jamie and um, our academic programming and education team who were already teaching with the works from the contemporary Native art collections um, and working um, with school groups um, in our Bernstein Center for Object Study before the museum even opened. Um, so I will speak a little bit about some of the lessons that happened before the museum opened to the public. But before I do, I really want to talk about museum education and what a museum educator is. Um, people often ask me when I say I'm a museum educator, they say, oh, you teach from art? Or, oh, I mean, they, they say, oh, you teach art or, oh, you teach art history. Um, and I have to explain that really I am teaching um, bigger concepts bigger skills, 21st century learning skills, um, like, practice, like getting kids to practice thinking like an artist, thinking creatively, thinking critically, and using works of art as a way to jump into these conversations about themselves, about the world around them, about the artist's experiences. So I really say that I teach from art and I try to get at these big picture ideas. Um, and so as my um, in my role as museum educator, I teach the multiple visit school programs. And what I mean by multiple visit is that these students who are part of these programs, Art Start and Images, get to come to the museum four or five times throughout the year. So I work with a range of schools from Vermont and New Hampshire, and the students are all in second through sixth grade. And their class comes to the museum four to five times a year. And we look at art together, um, most often in the museum, but before we had a museum, we did a lot of looking at art together outdoors. Um, Dartmouth has an amazing collection of public outdoor sculpture. And um, so we look at art, we talk about art, we really explore it together. It's conversation-based, it's inquiry-based, and they always get to make art um, based on what we looked at and what we talked about. Um, and connect the ideas that they're thinking about and learning about to their own experience of art making. So in my second year as museum educator at The Hood, um, I was designing my lessons for the Art Start and Images year. And there was a time period in um, January, I, I would say late December to January, where teaching outdoors was no longer a viable option due to the weather. Um, my students would come to their museum visits in early December in full snow gear. And um, so I had the unique opportunity of teaching for, um, I think the some of the first groups in our brand new Bernstein Center for Object Study, um, which we were opening with the new museum in January, 2019. And the Bernstein Center for Object Study is amazing in that we can pull works of art from our collection that would otherwise be in storage and use them to teach classes and a wide range of curricular areas. Um, and so I had over 65,000 objects at my disposal to choose from to teach this lesson. 
And I decided that I wanted to focus on Native American art. And there were three reasons for that decision. The first is that um, I had never taught from Native American art. I worked at a museum of modern and contemporary American art in New York City for six years before coming to the Hood Museum, but there was rarely any work or exhibitions featuring Native American artists. So I did not have a lot of opportunity um, to, to teach from indigenous collections. The second reason is that my colleague Vivian Ladd had recently launched an amazing collection of online teacher resources featuring our Native American collection um, that was funded through an IMLS grant. And so I was excited to take advantage of the resources that she had created online for my teachers to be able to use in their classrooms before bringing their students to the museum. And then last, Jamie had just come on board recently um, as did Morgan Freeman, the Native American Art Fellow. And so we had our first ever Native American Art curat Curatorial Team at the Hood. And I was very excited to begin collaborating um, because the connection between curatorial work and education work is so important. So for this lesson, I chose two historic works and two contemporary works from our Native American collection. And um, I had to do a lot of studying and reading and researching and speaking with Jamie and Morgan to really think about how to present this material um, and do it respectfully and model terminology I was using to the students. And what I came to found, I learned a lot of lessons um, through teaching this unit. What I came to found, find is that time and time again, my students were using past tense when we were looking at contemporary works of art. And I was really grappling with trying to figure out why that might be and how to start shifting that. And I think for many of my students, the teachers I work with are unbelievable. For many of my students, they hadn't yet had a unit on Native Americans. And I think that in part speaks to some systemic issues in our education system. Um, and also there is a real lack of media representations of Native Americans in our society. Um, Jamie earlier made a joke about Pocahontas. Um, and I think over time, just realizing how little exposure there is to um, a multiplicity of representations, um, that is why many of my students were using past tense. Um, and so I, I reflected on this lesson a lot and the ways in which I could help um, shift this narrative and um, and dismantle this at a young age. Um, so again, we have another question at the bottom of the screen. And we want you to think about when you were back in school, um, maybe elementary school, maybe middle school, and think about what you learned about Native Americans. And again, you can enter those into the chat and include your name if you don't mind us sharing. And I just wanna say, while this work was new for me, I hadn't taught from Native American art before, it wasn't new to my colleagues in education and academic programming. They were doing amazing work with this collection long before I arrived. Um, and a lot of great work was being done in particular with high school students, with adults in our adult workshops and with teachers. And so here you see a group of teachers um, at a teacher workshop, which was focused on innovation. And they are looking at this work by artist, um, Cherokee artist, Shan Goshorn. And they were really thinking about some of the complex and brutal histories um, surrounding the Carlisle Indian boarding school using this work of art. And so in education and academic programming, um, we, we find these works to be so rich because they pull you in visually. So many of the works in our, our collection, especially the contemporary Native American works, they pull you in visually and then they lead so well um, into a conversation about com complex issues, um, critical issues, things that we need to be talking about in our society. Um, and we just wanna show you some other ways that other groups are engaging with these collections. Um, because it's not just the work that we do with young kids. Yeah, so this is a um, an introduction to cultural anthropology class um, 
that I've been teaching along with my colleagues, uh, Amelia Kale and uh, Kathy Hart in academic programming. Um, and the, this class has been, they keep coming back. They've come uh, three to four sessions every term. Uh, and it's been really interesting to um, talk with Dartmouth undergraduate students about these works. And even though um, this is a series by Wendy Redstar called The Four Seasons, um, there are three here. Uh, I believe it's uh, spring, uh, winter, and fall. Summer was on view in the gallery at the time. Um, but what is really interesting about these works is even though they're contemporary, um, they're also talking about these really complex histories of colonialism and um, ethnographic, early ethnographic research and the history of early photography and how all of these um, have had an impact on the ways uh, the mainstream public um, understands and thinks about um, indigenous peoples. So here, um, the artist um, has kind of staged these um, photographs of herself wearing her regalia um, in the different seasons. Uh, and it looks, it doesn't look staged when you're a little bit uh, farther away, but as you get closer, you notice that the, um, the elk in the image on the right is a uh, blow up animal, that the flowers are silk that the backdrops are printed out um, and you can see the fold marks on them. And so she's really inviting us into a conversation about um, portraiture and the ways that, um, you know, these kind of staged photographs um, uh, have really been limiting for the ways people conceive of indigenous uh, uh, folks within our society. Um, this is also something, um, if you go to the next slide, Jamie, um, this is one of our conversations and connections, um, which is a public program that we have um, on Wednesdays um, at 12.30. So actually, this is kind of a, a conversation and connection um, in a weird virtual space. Um, but this uh, was a conversation about um, the photography within our opening installation. Um, and we were talking about um, kind of this image uh, on the left of uh, Cara Romero's and how she placed uh, Tewa individuals um, uh, from uh, uh, Cochiti Pueblo uh, in, uh, in front of this series of television screens in the New Mexico landscape. And those television screens have images of different media representations, um, both uh, things like Lone Ranger and Tonto and Billy Jack and Little Big Man, um, but also news footage. So footage of um, the testing of uh, nuclear bombs in um, the Southwest on federal land, which is often tribal land. Um, and that's had a very detrimental effect on the health of many indigenous uh, nations. Um, and the, another image is the uh, takeover of Alcatraz Island. And so the photographer here, the artist, is really, by placing these individuals in front of those television screens, is asking us to look at these individuals and to deal with, um, or to kind of look at them as humans before we look at these media representations. And the thing that I love most about working with our collection, um, our contemporary Native American collection, is really that we are all teaching with the same objects and having uh, the same conversations um, about really complicated issues. Um, we're just using different language to do it. And so as, you know, where Jamie is and uh, her colleagues are preparing um, young people to have these conversations at an earlier age, um, I think about, you know, 30, 40 years from now, what our conversations and connections might look like and what kind of conversations we'll be having then. Um, so it's really exciting to work with this collection. Like Jamie said, um, we really, as a teaching museum, we're really trying to um, tackle and discuss and address some complex issues. And I have to figure out how to make a, an eight-year-old or an 11-year-old um, understand and be able to contribute to this conversation. 
So after my first lesson on Native American art, I spent a lot of time reflecting on it. Um, I really was struck by the use of past tense and I wanted to think about the different ways I could um, use art as a way to bring in contemporary Native American um, experiences and perspectives into my curriculum. So I decided two things. One, that it was really important to me to work with contemporary art and to bring the artist's voices into my lessons um, so that students could hear from the artists themselves. And the second thing was that, um, the second thing was that I really wanted to tackle some bigger issues. Um, I said before, I teach from art and, and we, we address some of these issues through the art. And so I wanted to think about how I could create an entire lesson based on stereotypes and why an artist might want to make a work of art that makes us question or rethink or dismantle stereotypes. And so I created an entire lesson um, based on um, an exhibition that Jamie was planning and another work in our Native American collection featuring contemporary artists. Um, and so I was really excited because my two goals of, of teaching from contemporary art and getting to this idea of stereotypes um, were able to come to fruition the following year because Jamie was planning two major exhibitions featuring contemporary artists. So I'm going to let her explain the first exhibition. Yeah, so this show um, I curated, co-curated with um, Morgan Freeman, our Native American art fellow, um, and uh, Sipix Dartmouth with Kaylee Spitzer and Will Wilson um, is an iteration of uh, the Sipix project with which Will Wilson um, began in 2012. Um, and CIPIC stands for the Critical Indigenous Photographic Exchange. And it is, um, it began as a response to the work of Edward Curtis and the 100th anniversary of his North American Indian portfolio, um, but really has become um, a project that is about centering um, uh, Indigenous peoples and all people um, within portraiture um, using the same technology that early photographers using the wet plate colloidian process, um, but really um, giving individuals the agency to pose themselves, to represent themselves um, how they want to. And if you go to the next slide, um, what we did uh, was we had a 10 day residency for the artists um, where we actually set up a photography studio in the galleries and we had uh, uh, Will actually travels with this um, ice fishing tent that has been converted into a dark room uh, and they um, do the whole process and so people would sit for their portrait um, and then be able to go into the tent uh, and watch them being developed and um, it was a really interesting way to um, invite people into the process of art making and to think really deeply about uh, the, all of the work that goes into just making a single image. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, um, this, we're going to show a clip, a time lapse here of uh, Will photographing one of uh, the iconic pieces from the Native American collection at the Hood, um, Apache Pull Toy by artist uh, Bob Houses. Um, and this, uh, to this point, um, what uh, Will has done is he has um, uh, coated an aluminum plate um, and placed it in a bath um, that turns it into film. He has dropped that into the camera and you will see a, a flash pop um, of him taking the photo. And so if you'll start it, then I'll talk through the... So there's the flash. And now um, he's going into um, the dark room and he is um, putting the developer on the plate, um, rinsing it off in water, and now putting it into the fixer. Um, and so, uh, one of the really wonderful things about um, this was the ability to invite community members to sit for portraits, but also to see the process of having them um, 
developed. And then the next slide I believe shows um, two of our sitters. Um, so from the, there were 131 plates taken of 167 different um, Dartmouth and Upper Valley community members. And one thing that Morgan and I decided to do with this exhibition was instead of us writing labels and writing about the people pictured, um, we actually invited um, uh, sitters to write their own labels and to, um, we gave them the prompt of, you know, tell us about yourself and what, what you would like um, the community to know about you um, alongside your image. And so these are two Dartmouth students, um, Native students, uh, Annalise and AJ, um, standing next to their portrait. And this one was actually, this was a really fun moment because just as um, we, I had taken this picture and we were headed back out of the galleries, Jamie was coming up the stairs with one of her um, Art Start and Images classes um, that, uh, and introduced these two to them and the kids all thought that they were famous, which was really fun. Um, another thing that, um, about experiencing this um, that was important for Morgan and I was to really have our education and academic programming team, um, as well as our docents who do so much of um, the teaching with our collections and interface with the public in the galleries um, more often you know, than I do as a curator, um, for them to experience sitting for a portrait themselves. Um, and we also had the opportunity to have many hood staff. And so the, the actual process of sitting for a portrait can be kind of uncomfortable. You have to sit under hot lights um, and be incredibly still. And by the time they get everything set up, you're sitting there for several minutes. Um, and then, you know, if someone blinks, you have to do it all over. Uh, and so I think it really, um, you know, had a, had a, a, a shift, it made me think differently about all of these, you know, historic photographs and how they were taken because, you know, back at the turn of the 19th century, um, you know, they didn't have the powerful flashes um, with, you know, 4,800 watt seconds of light that we had um, that were blinding, uh, but they were using natural light in many cases. And so um, people were having to sit still for 30 seconds and spending quite a bit of money on having these images taken. And so, you know, it really makes you think about like, oh, maybe that's why no one ever smiled in those portraits um, and everyone looks terrified. Um, so that was definitely a, a really unique experience. Oh, Jamie, you're muted. Yep. Um, I have to say, as an educator, it was unbelievable to sit for a portrait and to be able to speak to the artist. Um, because it made my ability to explain it to the kids that much clearer. Um, and I was able to show them photos and videos of the whole process. So um, once this exhibition went up, I began teaching all of my art start and images students, my second through sixth graders. With this unit, I had um, centered on this idea of breaking down stereotypes. So first, we had to establish what a stereotype is and define it in a way that was developmentally appropriate to them. And then I asked them to consider, to think about their own experiences when someone might have made an assumption about them um, based on how they look, and to think about why an artist might choose to make art that gets us to think about um, stereotypes and gets us to think beyond the visual. Um, and so we spent time in this exhibition, we spent a lot of time in this exhibition, and immediately the students were struck by these works of art by Will and Kaylee. They have such presence, and the students realized that the artist, by focusing on these people's face, um, faces, by blowing them up big, they really were here in the room with us, um, and that each person's individu individuality was celebrated. They each had their own space and presence on the wall. Um, and so I explained to students that this project 
was started as a response to Edward Curtis's photos in which he was going into Native American communities and making decisions for the sitters about what they should wear, about um, what objects they should hold. Um, and so I explained to Will and Kaylee that it was important to them that the people in the photographs, the sitters, made their own choices about how they are portrayed, what they wore, what objects they brought, how they chose to pose, um, what they're doing with their face. And so before I gave them any information about the sitters, I had, I had my students just look at them and think about those visual clues, the vis visual information, and um, start to sort of think about what it could mean for someone to wear their hair in a certain way or to dress in a certain way. Um, but then it didn't just stop there because, you know, when we look at just, if we try to, to learn about a person just by looking at them, that's where assumptions and stereotypes get made. And so I explained to them that this was very unusual, but Will and Kaylee and the curators, Jamie and Morgan, instead of having the museum write the wall labels, the curators, that they invited, Will and Kaylee and Jamie and Morgan, invited the sitters to write their own labels, to tell their own stories. And so the students started to re realize that their initial impressions of the people changed when they heard their own voices. And so some assumptions that they might have made, um, they were able to get a fuller understanding of that person through the sitter's own voice. And so they were able to really get at some difficult conceptual ideas here and realize that you can't really judge a person um, by the way that they look and that this exhibition was really celebrating individual, individualism and um, a multiplicity of nat contemporary Native American experiences. Um, so then we compared, we had that, that discussion, we explored those works, and then we went to this work of art, which definitely was a jump because these works of art are very different um, in material. Um, this work of art, What Do You Want? When Do You Want It? by Jeffrey Gibson is one of our favorite works of art to teach from in the collection because it is a showstopper. Um, you can't help but look and get sucked in, but also um, it allows you to teach from multiple different lenses. So the year before I had taught from this work of art through the lens of materiality, but this year I decided to challenge myself and teach this work of art through the lens of identity and continue this conversation about stereotypes. And so I asked students what this work reminded them of, and they said vulture and giraffe and horse and dancer, and they said all these different references, and yet they couldn't put their finger on any one thing. This did not represent any one thing that they knew of. And so, you know, I said to them, well, is this any of those things? And they were like, not really. And so I asked them how this connected to our conversations about stereotypes. And that is a huge conceptual leap for, you know, a 10 year old to make. But because we had really done this work thinking about this and unpacking this, they were able to realize that if you can't label someone or something, then how do you stereotype them? If you can't label them, how do you make an assumption about them? Um, and this is exactly one of the things Jeffrey Gibson talks about with this work. He said, I don't want this work to have a tribe or a gender or sex prescribed to it. Um, and so students were really able to understand this really ambiguous concept through this work of art. But our lesson didn't end here um, because all of our lessons end with art making. And that's what's so special about this multiple visit program. Every single time they come to the museum, they get to make art in response. And so for their art project, um, I asked them to think about their identity, their own story, what they want to share with others, and what they want to celebrate about themselves. And so they worked on self-portraits through photograph and collage and drawing um, to communicate and share something about themselves inspired by these contemporary works of art. Um, all of the examples that Jamie and I have presented so far have been facilitated experiences, meaning there's an educator or someone from academic programming or a curator speaking to a group or docents speaking to a group facilitating an exper exper experience, sorry, 
Um, and so Jamie and I wanted to work on something that families could do on their own in an unfacilitated way. And we've been making family activity guides at the museum for many years. And um, here we wanted to try to address some, this, this big idea of identity through an unfacilitated experience. So we were kind of experimenting with seeing whether we can convey these difficult, um, complex issues through a card. And so the card takes families through a general looking exercise featuring um, port portraiture, pose, facial expression, clothing, setting, and objects. But then it explains this idea that you can't judge a person. Um, you can't judge a book by its cover. You can't judge a person just by looking at them and that it's important to hear the sitter's own words. Um, and so families were able to read the wall labels together and have a conversation about that. Uh, so the last uh, case study we're going to talk about um, before we get to your questions is um, our most recent exhibition um, uh, that uh, uh, my curatorial fellow Morgan and I co-curated um, that happened to open to the public the same day we closed to the public, um, which I'm clearly not upset about at all. Um, but the, um, uh, you know, this was a, a show that we worked on for nearly two years. Um, and so it was really an opportunity for uh, me as a curator to work um, with, the ex with the exhibitions team, um, you know, as usual, but also the education and academic programming teams from a very early point in this exhibition um, planning process. Um, when we were forming the checklist and thinking about programming um, and label writing that, you know, we were talking really consistently and collaborating on this show. Uh, Form in Relation examines the work of North American indigenous artists whose practices are grounded in our relationality to the land and to one another. These artists are using clay as a central organizing medium and the exhibition um, or in the artists um, draw not only on the materiality of the clay but on the knowledge that's embedded within the land. Um, within the clay. So uh, the artists in the show um, are really exhibiting complexity of expression, both in the themes they address, such as gender, um, extraction, language, responsibility, uh, community, but also in the techniques that they employ to create their works. Um, Anita Fields, Courtney M. Leonard, uh, Chinupa Hanskaluger, Ruben Olgan, Rose B. Simpson, Kaylee Spitzer and Roxanne Swensel are uh, artists leading conversations not only within the field of Native American art, but within contemporary art more broadly. And the works uh, in this exhibition raise really important questions that um, communities across the globe are grappling with. So in the same way that when we have um, these facilitated um, experiences with uh, classes and uh, through programming, uh, where we pose questions. Um, we also use this, uh, um, Morgan and I used this um, introductory panel as a space to pose questions to our audience. So those questions are, how can we shift our understandings of the land from one of ownership and extraction to one of relationality? How do we move toward a recognition of our shared humanity? And how do we create a world in which future generations can thrive? Um, questions that I think are um, even more pertinent um, in our current moment. Uh, one of the works in this exhibition um, that uh, immediately felt uh, like it was a great opportunity for us to teach with um, is this life-size ceramic um, bison skeleton by Chinuba Hanska Luger. Um, in this piece, he's thinking about the symbiotic relationships that sustain the environment, but also um, his community in North Dakota. And he is looking at the decimation of the bison population during the 19th century. Uh, so this piece um, is ceramic steel, um, felt and ribbon, and um, is a life-size, uh, uh, bison skeleton, it's rather large, that's a nine foot platform 
um, that it's sitting on. And it's accompanied by a video where the artist placed the piece in a river um, and filmed drone footage over the river um, as he reads a poem. And so, uh, you know, there are a lot of great opportunities to teach with this piece, as well as one other um, exhibition from, or one other installation from the exhibition by Shinnecock, Shinnecock artist um, Courtney M. Leonard. Um, this piece called Breach Logbook 20 Nebulous is um, a site-specific installation that um, examines the Connecticut River from the Wilder Dam, just right um, uh, between Hanover and West Leb. Uh, and uh, down to where the Connecticut River um, meets the ocean and is looking at um, the, the issues of, um, or the relationships we have with our aquatic ecosystems. Um, as someone um, from, uh, as she refers to herself, the artist is a water person, um, she really thinks about deeply about what happens um, in our oceanic environments. Um, and I'm going to read a brief quote from her. Uh, the Shinnecock, and actually, could you go to the next image? Um, the Shinnecock Reservation is located on the east end of Long Island, with the Hamptons bordering our territory. As a small coastal indigenous community that was not relocated from our homelands, we are dealing with major environmental concerns, such as rising waters, coastal erosion, toxic shellfish warnings, nitrogen runoff from industrial agriculture and sewage, and violations of our fishing rights, water rights, and land rights as cultural stewards. Our survival was and continues to be dependent on maintaining our stewardship of the land and waters for all of our relations. And so this installation um, uh, on the stairwell here, you can see, um, is thinking of uh, exploring uh, the impact of ghost fishing, which occurs when castaway aquaculture traps and nets are left in open waters. Um, these uh, ghost traps continue fishing aquatic species in a ghost-like fashion with ropes and cords that often fatally entangle whales, seals, and other species. So the deep blue color on the walls is the kind of the water and you can see these um, crab pots and um, other traps that are protruding from the surface um, of the water creating these um, kind of contour lines that are um, representative of the ripples in the water. Um, and I really am looking forward to teaching with this in person. You have to see it in person. Yeah, I was going to say, I've been beyond excited all year for this exhibition and particularly this installation. It is so immersive and it's just, it's, it's powerful. The inventive use of ceramics is fascinating. Um, and so I had been planning to teach a lesson on this for my art start and images units at the end of this year, at the end of the school year. Um, and while we'll have to wait on that for the moment, um, we also created some activity cards, just like the CIPEX card that I showed you earlier. And again, this idea of using the art to address a bigger issue um, or to think about um, something in our lives. So while the first card addressed issues around identity, this one we collaborated to really think about activism and taking action and the environment. And so this card invites families to look at Courtney's installation and at Chinupa's bison skeleton and to think about the impact humans have on the environment, on the land, on the water, on the animals. And to actually take it a step further and think about what people can do in their own homes to make a difference. What's one thing you can do to take action to help the environment? And then to think about what is the impact of that? Where is a place um, or something in the environment that's important to you that you help to protect and sustain? Um, so we're looking forward to getting back into the museum and, and using these cards and teaching from this work. But in the meantime, I just wanted to share some of the, some of the work that we're doing virtually with this exhibition. Um, I was quite saddened when the museum closed the day the exhibition opened. Um, and so I decided to create an activity pack 
based on four works of art in this exhibition for teachers to send their students to do at home as an assignment. And for the assignment based on Courtney Leonard's installation, um, students explored the work of art through photos, they learned about ghost traps through a video, um, and they researched ways that they can reduce plastic in the oceans. Um, and so here are your three examples. The one on the left is mine, um, but the other two are um, from a nine-year-old and 11-year-old. And I think the eat out of cones poster um, is something we all can get behind. Um, so their assignment was to create a poster to convince others to reduce plastic um, and help the environment. And next week I'll be meeting with a middle school class, one of my images classes, for them to present out the work that they're doing um, from this at home activity pack based on form and relation. So with that, we're going to turn it over to Sharon who will moderate um, the Q&A. So if you have any questions for us, um, thank you so much for being with us today. This is a, a image of that piece belonging um, in, in the river. So. Oh, you're muted, Sharon. It always happens. There we go. <laughs> there. Um, thank you, Jamie and Jamie. So again, don't be shy about entering your questions into the Q&A. We'll give you a moment to think about it. And I think while we do that, we'll go back and read some of the, the great things that people shared about their early experiences in museums. So I'd like to start here. Um, Allie writes that her first museum experience, she remembers was from her Washington DC trips when she was in eighth grade and how it changed her life. She writes specifically, my trip to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum opened my eyes to how important it was to keep history alive. It was that museum that laid the groundwork for my career as first a museum educator and now a public school teacher. So thank you very much, Allie, that's fantastic. Uh, we have someone else who writes, from the age of 10, I frequently visited the design and exhibition department at the MFA Boston, and I enjoyed seeing the behind the scenes work, and yes, it did have an impact on my career, and I will reveal that that's actually from our own um, Sue Achenbach, who works as a museum preparator for us, so thank you, Sue, for sharing that. Um, we have lots of... Um, Vivian says, I didn't really go to museums until I was a teenager looking for warm free spaces to hang out with friends on the weekend. And I love the sense of discovery as we wandered from room to room. Rebecca writes, my experience as a child was very limited to school outings. I didn't fall in love with museums until my late twenties when I went to the Gardner Museum in Boston. And since then I've been making up for lost time. It did not impact my career, however, but it has had a strong impact on my personal interests. And then we have another uh, participant who says later in college, my art history professor required that we learn the name and date for every work of 18th century art on view in the Met. And we had a feeling of excitement wandering from room to room, trying to find 18th century objects in period rooms, elevator vestibules and galleries. And it was then that it occurred to me that I might want to pursue a career in art museums. So that's what we have for people's early experiences. And I'm happy, um, I do have a, one question that I would love to share. Um, and then we could dive back into, um, there were some comments about um, what people learned early on in school about Native American history. Um, but we'll start with a question uh, for either Jamie, but um, are there plans for any future um, contemporary Native American art exhibitions at the Hood? Yeah, so um, we have, uh, a few, we always have more coming, um, but this, uh, uh, later this summer or whenever we're able to reopen to the public, um, we'll be putting um, an incredible uh, painting by uh, Jean Quick to see Smith um, one of her trade canoe series that is a loan 
um, to the museum. Um, and the, the work um, actually dovetails really nicely um, with these works um, because it's thinking about uh, climate, global climate change and rising sea levels. Um, within that piece, so it'll be really exciting to kind of um, dig into that imagery. And this question is for Jamie Powell. Um, could you talk about the complex relationships between native peoples and mass media from your experiences in terms of mixed emotions and relationships to contemporary native art? Yeah, so, um, you know, a lot of these images are really complicated. Um, you know, it, I, this makes me think about the, the mascot debate and whether or not, um, you know, Native Americans should be used as mascots uh, because there are so few representations of Native peoples in the mainstream media. Um, there are a lot of people who are worried about, um, well, if we don't have Chief Wahoo from the Cleveland uh, MLB team, will we have any representation? Um, you know, the Landa Lakes just um, changed their um, their design of their logo and took off the um, the uh, the image of the Native woman um, on their packaging, and um, there was a lot of div division um, within Indigenous communities who um, say, well, if you're removing this, then you're only left with the land, and um, it may make people forget about us even further. Um, so I think it is really complicated, and so um, you know, but what's really important is that the, the imagery that we're, um, we're placing um, in our galleries and on view um, are respectful uh, representations um, that people can be proud of. Um, and another question, wondering if you could speak to the size of the Hood's Native American collection and the relation, the proportion of historical objects to contemporary objects? So we have um, around 4,000 objects in the Native American collection. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, just under 200 are um, contemporary. Um, uh, but that doesn't count all of the actually don't have an accurate count of the contemporary Native art because, um, you know, that includes a lot of the work, um, uh, but not all of the, um, the ceramics have been um, identified. Uh, but it is, we do have a much more historic work um, than contemporary work because of the, the fact that the museum was, before it was the Hood, it was the Dartmouth College Museum and it was um, an ethnographic collection of Native American art. So a lot of the collecting um, happened through the anthropology department and research that um, Dartmouth professors were doing. Fantastic. I think we're almost out of time. So I think we have time for one more question. And that is um, for either of you, but maybe perhaps more for Jamie Rosenfeld. Is there an object um, in the collections that you have not yet taught with in Native American collections that you're excited to teach with? Um, that's a great question. Um, oftentimes when I'm picking what to teach from, I start with what's really exciting to me because I think that that excitement rubs off on the students. They can tell when I'm excited. Um, so there are many works that I would love to teach from, from the collection um, and specifically, um, a lot of the works that Jamie has recently acquired, um, but the one I am the most excited about from a personal um, place is the Ken Williams Jr. work um, that Jamie recently acquired. And Jamie, maybe you could say a couple of words about it. Yeah, actually I can do um, one better. I'm gonna take over screen sharing here um, and I've pulled up uh, an image um, of the work by uh, Ken Williams, are you seeing it? Mm -hmm. um, so this is a beaded bag by Ken Williams Jr. Um, that is based off a historic photograph of a Shoshone couple, um, but is also inspired by a bag of cotton candy. So you can kind of see these um, tufts of cotton candy. And so these are all um, glass beads 
um, that the artist has used. Um, and as I zoom in here, you can see the quills um, that he's used. And these are real uh, feathers and wool used to make this um, war bonnet that the gentleman is wearing. And so this, you know, really shows kind of the, the playfulness um, of and humor of indigenous artists, um, but also the, you know, the ways that history is woven into these contemporary experiences um, in meaningful ways. And I, I'm just blown away by the inventiveness, by the creativity, the use of materials and the humor. Um, and I think kids especially will really respond to that. Well, uh, thank you so much to Jamie and Jamie. We really appreciate um, the wonderful program that we've had here today. Um, we are gonna wrap up. I just wanted to say to everybody who's able to join us today, you will find a link to a survey in the follow-up email that you'll receive tomorrow. We do appreciate your feedback. You can register for upcoming programs on the Hood Museum's website or through the Facebook uh, Dartmouth events calendar. And we do hope you enjoyed your time with us today. Again, I know it was gorgeous out. So thank you so much for uh, sharing this time with us. And we look forward to getting together with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone should go get ice cream cones. Excellent idea.